as an orchestral player, I feel I'm, I'm kind of shocked, or I was shocked at the start of COVID, how little control I actually had over my day-to-day -day performances. So much was decided by you know the general manager, general manager, the administration, um, conductors, the musicians that I'm playing with. There was just everything had has had been decided, um, and it's so easy to slip into that role as well, and sort of coast on that and, and take the role of everything will be fine because there are people in power who know better than me, and I'm sure they're making the right decisions. Not really. That turned out to not necessarily be the case for some organizations. Absolutely. Um, Others not so much, um, but I think that's kind of exciting because it forces people to take control of their own careers and figure out how they want to present themselves. Somewhere over the course of 10 years, I know this happened for myself, I'm sure it's happened for others, it's easy to lose yourself and turn it into a, a game of, of success rather than why do I love music, what do I want the people around me to get from it? And so I. Over the last year, I kind of enjoyed that. I wasn't too experimental, but even doing, for instance, regular live stream concerts, which I had never done before, was terrifying to me in a completely different way from playing um, live concerts. Something about playing live stream, being nervous, playing for your laptop in your living room is kind of crazy. And so it pushed me in a lot of ways. And it sort of, I felt over the eight months, like, wow, I feel like I've gained some courage. I feel like I can push this a little more. It's it really, it's been like a huge silver lining because I've been able to experiment this year. After every concert, we did a survey, like a very honest survey. Please tell us, did you like this? Did you not like this? Should we do this? Or can we do a concert on a Friday? Or do you guys like Sundays? You know, like everything. And um, at the very beginning of this, I asked one of my uh, older adult students who is uh, a science Guy. he's a he's like a retired computer guy and very uh, that kind of a mindset which is I, i'm completely opposite you know i'm very um what's the word impulsive and i just do stuff you know i just make crazy decisions and have like a thousand ideas and he's the guy who was like no this is don't do this do this you know so he's been really great at kind of helping us steer and so uh we we approached everything very scientifically that was his idea so we have like a i have a hypothesis and then we test it out and if it doesn't work we throw it out um, they felt for the first time the value of what it means to connect with somebody live in a performance as opposed to what they'd been doing for you know 12 months when they first were able to give a chamber music concert you know at, at their graduation recital or whatever and and feeling the visceral and the visceral and palpable feeling of connecting with an audience as opposed to you know playing a concert no clapping it just sort of ends and then you walk off stage and you're done and i think that you know opposite a little bit of what we're talking about you know it reminds the students of that they're artists you know that that's what they do they're creating something that you don't want to just look at a picture of the of, of what the metropolitan museum of art has you want to go and walk around it and you know wait in line to see it because of the, the sheer beauty of seeing it in person now with respect to harvesting what we learned on, on the technological side uh, i plan to do supplemental teaching to my students la is a commuter place if you haven't looked at a map that LA is like, it's a huge city and our students live all over. And I'm planning to say to a conducting a student, you know what, you're doing fine. Let's zoom tonight. Uh, let me help you alone. You stay home, I'll stay home, we'll fix it. I'm also planning to have them teach themselves. Okay, Judy, you really got this. Billy, you're struggling. Judy and Billy, I want you to set up a Zoom later today and I will be, uh, watching this to help you so that we're cultivating the idea of student as an engine, not as passive recipient of the wisdom of the King of Spain. So those are some of the ideas that I'm, I'm pursuing. And I, as you can tell, I'm very excited about next step. And uh, for me, this, this is among a few of the gifts that have been dropped in my lap uh, because of the COVID. Again, fortunate fall. There's always problems, always, all of us, all the time, navigating problems. Granted, this is a big one, 
But if you develop the chops to navigate the big ones, maybe the small ones seem more manageable. You know, depending on where we are in the world and depending on our experiences, we are all looking at this um, at a different angle. And I don't think that's necessarily bad, right? I think um, there's a lot to be learned. So I think of identity of our students engaging with, um, in a soul capacity with accompanists, engaging with the audience, I still think is a large part of their identity, sharing what they do with audience members in a face-to-face venue. They, 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 they desired this year and we weren't able to have audience members in. So they had these performances that we recorded and then they celebrated we put them live stream or sh- shared the recordings. Then there's the identity like in an ensemble, whether it's a large ensemble or whether it's a chamber music group. Um, that was very important to them that they had those ex- they had those opportunities this year. I heard it most I heard it most days, if not every day. The large ensemble, um, there was the roles of leadership that emerged because they were truncated fashions. We had to have so many people in a room at one time and shift them around and follow ventilation breaks and all the other protocols we had to do. But I saw this notion of the leadership roles emerging and the ability to, to come together from a product base, which identifies them as a musician, in spite of the truncated rehearsals that they endured throughout the year. And then I think too, I think, I think our, our young, I think our young people, the students, there, I find in the last five years, I, I still teach, and I find in the last five years, there's a broader s- shift to who they are as cross identities or multiple identities as a musician. There's a production part that's coming into the fore. There's a production part, I think, that we need to look at and incorporate into their education, right? That they had to engage in the shares. They had some online lessons and, and rehearsals and how did they function from a production perspective? And then I think that there's um, there's a notion of fluidity between how they how they produce productions and how they produce concerts in, in not just a, a traditional way, but some people you know someone mentioned going outdoors and finding other spaces to, for venues or being more of an entrepreneur. And I'm finding those conversations are much more present with young people, our undergrads than they were even three or four years ago. And I think this year has increased those notions of who am I as a musician? I am a multifaceted person. And the more multifaceted person I can become and experience and that you you provide us and I can engage with, then the more I can offer our, and share, share what they value. And that is making music. That has not died at all. Ralph, I'm also going to steal this thing that you were saying about and tell my students if it's okay that anytime anyone gets nervous for anything, it's like, are you standing backstage in a plexiglass box, not able to play your clarinet before you go on stage and play Hinostero with the Detroit Symphony? And I'd be like, there are no, there's no need for nerves if you're not doing that. It it didn't go great. Don't, I mean, it wasn't. (laughs) <laughs> was it one of our finest moments but what, who's, whose decision was it to schedule him the stare during covid someone who not a clarinetist it's, yeah, exactly. that's cruel that's just cruel well, i just like the urge to try that read it must have been like overpowering right just to, like make a sound <laughs> you know i mean it's like it's like i tell my students sometimes like sometimes you just have to trust you know and i'm sitting backstage just like i just have to trust i just have to trust, I just have to trust. like you know it, you know, here's another takeaway for me is is how privileged I've been in terms of dealing with performance anxiety through my job, because it's like anything else. Like if I have to be on stage six out of seven days a week and I'm playing four or five concerts a, a week, like eventually it doesn't it's not so hard anymore, you know. And so then my students are like, I struggle with performance anxiety. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, it's not that bad. Like you didn't Oh yeah, it's real bad. Now I know because you took my performances away and I don't have that buffer. Work's not doing it for me anymore. And now I'm like, oh my God, I totally get where you're coming from. Let's investigate this together and find something that's going to work for here and now for you and well, me. It is you know? stressful to engage in, in going out. Uh, it requires courage. And I think we're not facing it anymore. And so when it start again, 
it's going to be much harder to say like, hey, like I'm going to go somewhere I don't know anyone and see how that feels as opposed to just like, oh, I'll check what they're doing online and see if I miss anything. Right. Like I think a lot of people are going to like be encouraged to stay at home, me included. And and I feel like it would be good to find a way to promote the richness of the human experience. In the before times, uh, I really identified as an orchestral clarinetist, and I was still on the audition circuit. I was trapped in that limited lonely road of excerpts and technique and fundamentals. And now I'm kind of seeing the other side of the coin, and, and there's so much more to being a musician and an artist than trying to recreate that same group of like 10 perfect excerpts over and over again. That mindset really abstracts music and deprives it of meaning for me. So um, as Stephanie was kind of alluding to, I think this year has been really hard for a lot of orchestral musicians like myself who participate in a lot of smaller groups. Basically, the bottom just fell out for all of us. And uh, I play in the Lexington Philharmonic. We haven't performed together as a group since last March, which has been really hard. Um, so having that orchestral side of things taken away has, has led me to confront sort of those like hierarchies and structures within the world of classical music and really wonder if it's necessary to continue perpetuating that cycle and in training our students to keep conserving those same value mindsets. Um, so I've been trying to make space for other voices in the world of classical music and, and challenge those inherent systems of inequality. I'm trying to support and encourage other artists who have similar mindsets um, and share the same beliefs. And I'm also trying to um, challenge my organizations to do the same and confront their own policies. This whole talk about tokenism comes in when if it's programming and we play a piece by X composer and then at the end of that piece, everybody's like, yeah, well, I know why they played this piece because it's by, you know, this underrepresented composer. No, it needs to be very good. I'm very animate about that. It's got to be a good piece of music. Um, if if you hire a, 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 a black orchestral musician, they better be able to play or it, it's like, well, well, we know why they got the job. And then it just it just it just goes downhill from there. So um, but it, but I don't want to sit and wait for something that's perfect, <laughs> you know, too. We, we program we program younger composers and 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 that's OK. Um, I work in a university with a composition department. We we have a program that we uh, partner with a, a student composer. Uh, the bands have done this and they write a piece like a five to seven minute piece for our groups. And we kind of mentor them along the way. And, and, you know, we don't expect that to be, you know, John Carigliano level, but they, you know, we'll program it and it's um it's a good experience for them. So I, I just I just want everybody out there to to just really number one be sincere in what you're doing and um and and if it's programming or any kind of opportunities or programs for students in the area just really make sure it it's of the highest level don't don't just you know neglect it because well this is something we have to do so let's check let's check this box so we can do the things we want we really want to do and the cool thing about everybody here is i i feel like everybody's in sincere you're you're either living it or you're really sincere about moving moving it along after being two years online seeing so many wonderful things so it is time not uh, to think about the public but think about us about myself what am i going to do different and the other thing is uh, i think liana just said that sometimes we hear this uh, no, but classical musicians don't do that. Who says that? I mean, who, who, wh why, why? That's one of the things I always uh, challenge. I mean, who is the key keeper of, of the rules? I mean, why? I mean, rules are made to, to be broken. And one of my favorite phrases I keep uh, telling is, uh, tradition exists to be challenged. I mean, that, that otherwise, I mean, <laughs> we will be living exactly after three, 400 years ago, but it's changing. We need to change uh, ourselves and propose new things. And we have to dare to, to fail, 
to be ridiculous sometimes, but that's the way how we learn and that's the way how we go in a different direction. We're going to have to reinvent what live performance is. And I think that's it. I don't think our communities are going to let us go back to normal. Like I'm in your like boilerplate symphony orchestra, right? The four masterworks a week, the pops the next week, the masterworks the next week, right? We're not doing that again moving forward. I don't think that's possible. Um, and I don't think the musicians want that. Like we have a lot more agency now than we've ever had. You know, we're, we're sharing ideas. Like the musicians of the TSO worked directly with the artistic department this year to plan all of next season. We have like 10, 11 soloists that are gonna be appearing with the orchestra that are members of the orchestra. We're get, being more active. Our communities are asking us to do things differently. Change your hiring practices, change your audition procedures, make them more fair and equitable and equitable because they are in, just incredibly inequitable right now. The, we need to have a reckoning with equity, not only in how we hire and treat our communities, but how we treat each other in the orchestra. Like, so it's a really great question. And I hate to be Pollyanna to say, um, no, we're not going back to normal, but I think it's gonna take people like us in this Zoom call right now to say, we are not going back to normal because it's not a sustainable model. We have shared problems that we can attack together. And now it's a matter of, of not throwing it all away when we get back to, full halls, because these, these are problems. Like we, we're seeing a generational shift, for example. And so having more streaming and digitization and all of that stuff be part of everything that we do and to be able to respond better to social justice issues as artists, you know, is, is really requisite if we're gonna um, be engaging younger audiences. So yeah, the biggest takeaway for me was just um, to quote one of my, my mentors, um, that the edge of the precipice is a lot closer than we think. Um, Nina Simon, our community engagement consultant, says that you know a great leader when they're able to see the edge of the precipice and to create an internal sense of urgency in order to get the organization to adapt quickly and like course correct before you just lumber off of a cliff. <laughs> and so I like to think of COVID-19 as a really painful taskmaster in that change but we will have to also create leaders who will be making decisions that will affect our live music industry and also you know, people who are going to be auditioning for jobs, et cetera. We will have to be equally vigilant to create um, healthy planning. And how can we create a culture within our organizations that um, questions tradition and is nimble and it, then it doesn't become so much about like, how can our diversity, equity and inclusion committee enact change? But it's more about how as an organization do we embrace change holistically? And so I think it's actually about creating um, uh, flatter organizations as a whole versus you know, top down structures. Um, and so I think if there are ways within the organization in a greater sense that you can encourage just, you know, uh, the, the brainstorming of ideas and the idea that we're going to enact changes every year and that it's okay that we didn't do the same thing that we did last year and that we can do things in new ways. I think that if that basic culture becomes implemented in so many organizations around the country, then it's so much easier to basically say, all right, we want to change our audition repertoire for this year. No problem. You know, we don't have to discuss it in these silos, in these microcosms. We can discuss it as, you know, our organization is comfortable with not doing something the way we did last year. And so that means it's easy for us to change and be nimble and, and, and make new decisions because we openly 
enjoy and appreciate and love and support, you know, the idea that change is going to be a good thing. And if it's not, then, you know, we, we value that no matter what, and we value the experimentation and just the openness um, on an organizational level. So I think it's actually um, so much not just about like the individual work that we're doing in all of these areas, but how we can get our organizations to actually be structured differently and create cultures that value just open and honest communication between all of their staff at all, all different levels. And, um, you know, I say that <laughs> at being a part of a five person organization, but also uh, our board of directors is 11 people total and um, we, you know, we're very small, but at the same time, we could have easily created a top-down structure where one person runs everything and, and nobody has has say and, and we feel like we have to do everything the same way every year, you know. So I, I think it's making that kind of organization is um is easier, right? Because one person bears the brunt of, of all responsibilities and they feel like they can get more done and it's harder to involve a lot more people into your decision-making. And that makes decision-making sometimes messier <laughs> as well. But but that's how you create a culture of being able to take on new opportunities and, and change and be nimble. And so um, I think that that's honestly um, one of the biggest suggestions. That, and, and one of the things that I think helps the most is just overall, how can we foster a culture that um, you know change and, and opportunity are accepted and appreciated uh, staff-wide. Um, meeting a world that will be different that be, than before the pandemic. And I think, I think what Laura's saying about many skills is so true and so, so, so excellently and so well put. Um, but it's, it's a question, it's nothing, is, nothing is, is going to be consistent and, and let's say sacred anymore. It, it's, it's, there's two ways to look at that. One, we can be very frightened of it and thinking, oh, everything's going to be different. The other way is we can say, oh, everything's going to be different. <laughs> and we can just take the, take the attitude that uh, difference means opportunity and those who actually are um, strongly motivated I, I found I've certainly found over my my time in, in music is that those who are strongly motivated toward music and toward what they do tend to tend to stay in the business and find a way some kind of a way to do it but it it does take patience and there's a saying that uh, you, you know you can do everything but not all at the same time <laughs> So you want to sort of sort things out and, and prepare, prepare for each uh, one. I'm, I'm sure like a lot of us, uh, uh, I'm, I, during this pandemic, we've had to ask ourselves a lot of questions about uh, how, how much do I love music? Um, why am I wanting to be a musician? What, what uh, uh, do I like to perform? Do I like, uh, do I like getting applause and, and, and to be... Uh, get my self-definition by getting applause or do I like the clarinet so much I just want to play that do I love music do I love playing with people do I, all these all these different things are potential motivators for us and I think if we um, can get a handle on that and as we enter the uh, enter this this new world that's coming quite quickly now <laughs> um, then then I think those who really must do music and I who shall we say are musicians, <laughs> not people who do music for a job, but people who are musicians uh, will we'll, we'll find a way. And I'd, I'd like to, um, I kind of like to think about it. Oh boy, the world's gonna be different when this is all over. <laughs> there, might, there might be a place for all my students I've been trying to teach over the years, <laughs> if they're patient and persistent. 